Aki Arponen. Correct. Correct. <laughs> Almost perfect. Uh, he is an archaeologist and a, a conservator at the Finnish National Museum. Exactly. Uh, he's also a fellow PhD candidate. Uh, doing uh, something that I'm quite excited to know more about, maybe over drinks, which has to do with the relic that is in the Turku uh, Cathedral. So, apparently, there is a hidden side to Aki when it comes to musical instruments. Well, not really. <coughs> hidden side. Um, you have to remember that uh, the Venetian Museum of Finland is not uh, specialized in, in any special brands of cultural history, so we, we have it all. And it means that we have something like more than one million objects there. And you have to remember that, or keep that in your mind, and when you are making questions for me, mm -hmm. so that we have something like 1,000 musical instruments, so it's quite a uh, small number of objects compared to the whole, 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 <laughs> Whole, whole, the whole collections. Um, can I tell you slightly yes. what we have? Yes. Um, so these 1,000 objects, uh, musical instruments, are divided into several uh, collections. And um, we have, for instance, we have uh, this Western type uh, classical uh, musical instruments like uh, keyboard instruments and uh, violins and um, lutes and like that. Uh, then we have um, ethnographic collections, different kind of ethnographic collections. We have Finnish uh, folk music instruments, quite a lot. But we have, for instance, a special collection called the Fenogric collections. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, musical instruments from the nation, uh, from the nations which are living, for instance, in, in Russia today, um, the Sami collection, and so on. Mm -hmm. And then we have, of course, quite exotic musical instruments too from different parts of the world, from Papua New Guinea, from Morocco, from South America, and so on. Yeah. So there is a lot of different kind of musical instruments there, but as we are not uh, specialized in, in music or musical instruments, they are not um, exhibited very much. Mm -hmm. They are not really researched very much, and if they are researched, we are always dependent on outsiders. Mm. We are not able to do that. So this is perhaps the clue here that we would like to know more about of them, but because we are talking about a museum collection, we have, of course, uh, always the but. Mm. that what you can do with these musical instruments. Yes. So that's a, a very good starting point. I must say that I had wonderful experiences uh, in Finland, the Turku Museum, also in Estonia. I have heard horror stories in other... It's not even a matter of parts of the world. It's uh, particular museums and uh, institutions are made up of people. And some people have different uh, mindsets. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they have different uh, agendas. Um, so, the main point that I would like to throw to the table is that, for the most part, uh, I would say, and I, 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 might, I might be challenged, Simon, but uh, for the most part, uh, the people in the museum and us uh, would have the same best interests is, is the instrument here the central, um, the main point? Do you want to say something about that, Sam, from your experience? So, how can we be on, always on the same side of the fence? That, that was my tease. Well, I think Aki's uh, introduction and writer there was very important. Mm -hmm. You know, he's in a museum, yeah. and he explained very carefully that. As I understand it, around 1% of the items in the museum are musical instruments. There already you have, you know, perhaps a, 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 an indication of one of the imbalances that needs addressing, which is, um, from our perspective, of course, you know, the things in, of all of the things in the museum, the musical instruments are the ones that need 
attention and, and um, perhaps need the protocols for access and handling renewing. But in terms of a museum, a general museum's perspective, that's a, t a tiny aspect of their business and day-to-day -day work. So that's something that we have to address very carefully, because that's often the case. Music, musical instruments in museums are very often not in specialist museums. They're a, a tiny fragment of, of, of a situation which uh, it's, it's unrealistic for us to expect museums to be able to address. You know, in fact, he has 1% of his items which are of interest to us. What, what's his interest in privileging that 1% over the other 99% of objects? It's entirely reasonable for that not to be, not to be the case. And, it's, and I'd add that you know, it's, it's wonderful when a, a museum makes it possible to measure an instrument. It's such a privilege. Because the time involved from a, cu from a curator um, you know, attending the end of the whole um, with, with the National Museum in Scotland, um, the collection is distributed across Scotland, so a curator has to go from Edinburgh to the local museum to be there to meet with the, the measurement team. And, and um, you know, as, as Zeshwan was saying, if, if it were possible to go in with the tools and the expertise to be able to capture all the data that you wished and take all the photographs and videos that would enable you to go back to a workshop with everything. If you could do that in an hour, it would be amazing. But the truth is, that's, that's unrealistic. And so there are, um, there are real challenges here that, that I think with, by coming together and having these conversations and by bringing together competence from different fields, <laughs> and this there's a real scope for making progress, so I'm excited that, that we are here and that these conversations are happening and I hope that, that uh, similar conversations are happening in other, for, for the other percents um, because of course uh, um, there will be similar discussions I imagine for, for those in other fields, not, this is not just the musical instruments, mm -hmm. um, but it is a, a wonderful to have this collaboration where the understanding of the objects um, is the greater understanding of the objects is the fruit of um, both the investment of the, of the museum and the investment of those communities of expertise beyond the museum. Um, and of course I want, want to add to that, none of us are experts there. We do not know the musical instruments. We know that this is musical instruments, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. And, and um, the catalogues, of course, they are not true. I mean, they, they have been written perhaps 100, 150 years ago, and the person most probably didn't know anything about musical instruments. So you can't rely on anything there. Mm. So you have to get all of it through, and it's a huge work if you want to find everything in points. This is in our collections. And um, then... Uh, May I interrupt? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, what you said was quite touching for me, because, as I said, I was extremely well received in, the, in Turku, in the museum. And they, they seemed excited, because mm -hmm. it was, okay, what, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, in my opinion, it's this and that. Mm -hmm. Oh, we were, we were told a different thing. Yeah. And I said, well, to the best of my knowledge, this doesn't go here. Mm -hmm. And they were like, they were like, okay, out of, let's take it, uh, you know, let's, let's, somehow take, make a note that yeah. we've been... I don't know, there was this kind of, oh, we've been deceiving people. Mm -hmm. Because there, I think there is it, it's like to a lot of Steve. Yeah. You know, sure. it's sure. like, oh, I don't know, it's like, you know, because we know so little about this mm -hmm. instrument. Mm -hmm. And then and then they took me, quite proudly, and I think they have reasons to be proud. They showed me, uh, I want to show another thing, you might know what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, and, they sh and, and it was a fragment. Do you think this could have belonged to a musical instrument? And I said, you mm -hmm. cannot say, but mm -hmm. but maybe someone else might. So, um, how can we help? Because it seems like we are available. Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, I, I, I have to say that we really love our objects. And we would very much like to know more about them. And our collection, collections have been visited every now and then by experts of musical instruments, but uh, absolutely it's needed more. 
And that is the way we can make them more visible to the audience too, when we know more about them, when we know the backgrounds, what, what, what they mean, what they were used for. But now we are more or less in a point of zero. Point zero. We have only the object, but we do not have the content. Yes, it, it's like window shopping. Oh, yeah. if you, you, you put it. You, you can go to the Stockmans and, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's it. yeah. Well, that's, that's very interesting. And the, I assume that uh, their enthusiasm was that. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us anything? Because then I think maybe it goes into the pile of the potential exhibit objects and it goes out of storage. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think you might be starting at the wrong point there, Conor, yeah. with greater respect. I think what you have to do is to start looking for ways in which you can find some common motivations. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, the things that you're describing are, are driven still by the motivations of the musical instrument community. Mm -hmm. And museums also have interests, have self-interests. And luckily, mm -hmm. one of the things that's interesting about musical objects and, and musical instruments is that they're part of musical life. And musical life is part of a lot of human lives. I mean, it's not a specialist thing. So, uh, and museums face difficulties in attracting publics and, and attracting funding, and they need rationales for doing that. And maybe what we could be helping with is initiatives that would help museums with their existing problems rather than adding to them by saying, you know, really what you should be doing is listening to us as experts. Yeah. Yes, of course, that would be very nice, but perhaps we need to focus our attention on the problems that museums have as well as, 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 as a shared motivation. You know, muse museums in the States are selling some of their musical instruments. Oh, really? Yeah, because, because they have too many objects and they have duplicates. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not an uncontentious issue, obviously, but increasingly the cost of storing something, and that's mostly what museums do, mostly they don't exhibit stuff. Aki, how many, how, what percentage of objects do you know are on view? Um, it's probably, I'm, I'm, I'm not being accusatory, I mean, it's, just, it's just the norm for museums, it's usually a small percentage. Uh, how many objects were there again? There were a million. Yeah, so, yeah. so that you have your yeah. answer right there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the interest of the show of our collection, I mean the musical instruments, it's changing. When we, when we make the new exhibition, yeah. it depends what is the uh, spirit of the time, mm -hmm. what, what, what we want to show. And in some cases, like now, there's hardly any musical instruments. In the previous uh, basic exhibition, we had several of them. Why a nice collection? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the, this is changing all the time. Mm -hmm. this, and this is something which I don't really understand what is, what is there in the background, but this is something what is happening in this museum world, this kind of tendencies which are changing all the time. Yeah. And they make sometimes harm because these basic exhibitions are most probably there 15 or 20 years. So, there's one generation who is not going to see any musical yes. instruments. Yeah. To your point, if these instruments would make sound again, in very controlled circumstances, um, could that be a motivation to bring people to the museums, not only to see the instruments, but listen to the instruments? And how could we have enough trust that this instrument... Well, that's, that's already happening to some extent, because there are some museums which do use that as a motivation for, for bringing in publics, especially those which are specialist musical instrument museums. But, I mean, I think one of the things that we were talking about this morning is how some of the technologies that Zeshan has been working with, for example, might be ways which are relatively novel, uh, relatively experimental ways of addressing the issue of uh, completing incomplete musical instruments, modelling instruments which are in museums, which are never going to sound like some of the yeah. ones that Barnaby was talking of about, and, and bringing them to a public, and that's something that is a shared motivation between, you know, musical and instruments, scholars, and and museums. We cropped up quite a lot of experience on that front in the European Music Archaeology Project, uh, because that was a five-year European project engaging a lot of museums all across Europe, and um, and I was um, deeply involved uh, with that um, because I was at the end of the line. So there was an awful lot of work that would happen before the instrument arrived uh, um, in my hands. And I was then engaged, 
paid through, through the project to prepare performances that would be delivered in the museum. So a lot of the concerts I give are in museums um, um, as part of exhibitions, uh, uh, temporary exhibitions or, 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 or permanent exhibitions, depending on, uh, um, on the status of that instrument in the collection. This one, in, in a, a, a wonderful museum in, in the town of Mega, um, um, south of Athens, um, uh, the display was completely transformed by the measuring and study of the instrument because the because when you pull pieces of of, of aulos out of a tomb, they don't necessarily and they get conserved. They don't necessarily end up in the same order that they had been. <laughs> um, all the order is is because this was an emergency excavation. The, the order wasn't actually very e easy to ascertain because it wasn't possible to take photographs in situ. <laughs> Um, so, um, the, the study by, uh, and actually the whole process of making it, actually, you know, this is experimental archaeology in practice, without going through all the steps of bringing uh, um, sonic life uh, uh, to that object. Um, you, there are certain things you, you can't learn. It's only by actually playing it that, that you, uh, and f figuring out uh, uh, um, the issues that, that certain things emerge. Um, so it's gonna, that's just maybe a case study of, of, of how much impact uh, the engagement can have um, for an object that's in a display case. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful process to be part of because then there are performances that school children can enjoy from their classroom at home. And, and the energy that I've witnessed that create whether it's for, for you know, in the outreach, I think a lot of a lot of museums um, have a a desire to to make their collections relevant to the to the population, and and there's something about the combination of audio, of music, with images, wonderful images of objects, and um, and text that digital collections um, in, increase the outreach and the safety. Of the objects. Uh, at, at the beginning, I forgot to say that uh, this needs not to be a voyeuristic experience. Uh, I, I forgot to say that the cube can start going around from the very beginning of the conversation because there's not so many of us. Maybe we should all be on stage here. But I, I do welcome, and I think we all do, I do welcome any uh, comment that you might have. And you might not even need the microphone, but, but the microphone is available to the best of my knowledge. So, uh, let's say that the Sibelius Academy starts an engagement in a conversation with the Finnish Museum, National Museum. Mm -hmm. How do you think that conversation would go? Why, how would it start? What kind of... So, to the point of Simon, it's important to um, identify the issues mm -hmm. and offer solutions. Right? So, I'm guessing, how would that conversation go? Yes, but... Yes, but you also have to understand our side. Yes, but you also have to understand our side. We're trying to have degrees in music and, mm -hmm. and we don't have access to the instruments. We really need your help. And basically, I think it, it, would, be, it would be very positive this, if, if you are trying to, or if you are trying to uh, suggest some kind of cooperation. But of course, then we have to know what you want. Mm -hmm. And I hope we are expressing what we want. Yes. And about this music in the exhibition, I'm definitely, this is my personal view that definitely we need everything for all our senses to make it more tempting, these exhibitions. And of course, music is one of these senses, but there could be something else too. And I know museums have tried to have something to touch on, so we could talk about hands-on objects, but the smell, for instance, is one of those things which could be ex exist there. Uh, but uh, yes, and uh, we have had some music in our basic exhibition before, and it was quite a tricky thing to do because we have an organ from the 17th century, and, and the mechanism wasn't functioning at all, but all, all the pipes were there. So they were taken out and we made a new system to use the pipes mm -hmm. and it functioned. We could get quite nice sound there and, and even 
the whole composition could be played with these organs. And the organ was there, and we had this audio there. And I think it was very, very nice. And you get a very particular atmosphere to this small room from the uh, 16th, 17th century church type room. And I, I, I would welcome that kind of uh, audio uh, experiences in, in the museums. But how to do it? That is, of course, a question. You, you raised the question very, very, very clearly. Understand what do you want, mm -hmm. what we want. Mm -hmm. So I would throw the ball to all the folk musicians here and to the Sibelius Academy students and the doctoral candidates and so on. What do we want? Um, from my standpoint of the research, it, it would be to build such a trustworthy relationship that I could learn from the conservators. Mm -hmm. and, I could, and we could have the most possible a access to the instrument once we understand each other, what to do, what, what not to do. Yeah. Um, because, uh, because, as you say, we want to build replicas and we, we want to make those instruments sound again. Mm -hmm. if, if, if it doesn't ruin the integrity of the instrument, even maybe make the original sound mm -hmm. in order to be able to you know, mm -hmm. make some kind of possible, even if flawed, comparison with our replicas. Mm -hmm. So that would be from my side. But you're, what, you want to say something? I'm, I'm feeling. No? Yes, please. I was hoping. <laughs> please, please we go. I think one of the things. There's a beautiful have... cube going, so you I know, think you I, I can speak loud. Beautiful uh, voice. <laughs> oh, 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 yes. All right. Uh, one, one key feature could be uh, to have this kind of um, benefits for the board about the, how the represent uh, the almost lost tradition to the people outside who doesn't know at all. For example, in my case, of both liars, for example. So they both could, like, the museums could benefit from that, that they would have a real player there. And then, again, the players could benefit about the um, possibility to contextualize the music they are making to the historical context uh, and how the instruments have looked like, and of course, if we have uh, instruments that can be played, really, or proper museum copies. So uh, I think that's one, one of the features what has been going on with Finnish Pope Liar, that there, there are proper uh, copies of the instruments, like very true to, true to the museum, museum instruments, so then you can also play the very close to the original copies there in the museum. So the audience could have the experience of the context better than, like from the folk, folk music play point of view, the audience could understand the context better. And from the museum point of view, they could have really hear that this is obvious, but how the action, real action, have been with the instruments which you don't have any more any like evidence that has been sound like. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, how would that, from from a financial standpoint, how would that look from both the museum standpoint and the Sibelius Academy or the the, music, the musician standpoint? Shall I jump in here? I, I, just because I, I do so much work with museums, um, mostly in the UK, but not only in the UK. Um, um, it's wonderful to be contacted by the outreach, the public engagement um, events organisers um, at the museum. So that's my work, or part of my work. Um, and so I then have conversations, often two years before an exhibition opens. Um, and and developing the sorts of public events and workshops that might be part of an exhibition. Um, and an exhibition also has an opening, well, um, there are events that, that museums and all institutions do with their patrons and in, investors and, and the, the sponsors. Um, 
And so, as a musician, I can just say that, that, that on uh, looking at a, uh, whether it's in Greece or in Italy um, or in France um, um, or, or, or the British Museum um, or the, no, the London Science Museum, um, what has been, what I have felt works um, is when uh, music, just opportunities are found to weave in those interactions uh, whenever they are. And sometimes they're cultural events, sometimes they're fundraising events, sometimes they're outreach events. Um, but um, uh, the conversations that happen when you get in from the access point to, to the, you, know, you might have a little chat with the museum director, or I have the privilege of, of 30 seconds chat with the president of Greece when he opened the Science Museum exhibition that's on at the moment. These little conversations are incredibly valuable. Uh, and part of what, sort of, I suppose, um, feeds, nurtures the whole ecosystem of these instruments' continued life in the museum case. And it is a use uh, um, that, or, and it may be the draw in the, in, in the storage facility. Um, but uh, um, and it may remain in the in the drawer in the storage facility, but it's safe. So many of the the, the, the traces of, of Greek alloy have have been lost in museums uh, through handling. You know, it's a reality. There are there are real dangers dangers with the delicate parts being being handled, and they disintegrate. Um, um, and and um, or you know, Tutankhamun's trumpets being played disintegrating on camera. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, you know, so, so there are just nightmare scenarios and, and bits that, you know, when you have trays brought back from Sudan, containing all, you know, meticulously arranged, but they get shoveled around in transit, and they arrive in Austin or wherever, and, 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 and you've lost data because nobody thought to take a photograph before the journey, you know, these sorts of things, <laughs> which are very frustrating. Mm. Um, but there are lots of opportunities for cultural um, um, many, many opportunities for interactions that, are, that, 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 that I think are win-win for research, for the public and for the museum. Yeah. And I, I would underline this, now we are talking about this data, because we are like the Gerberos there, we want to save the data, and that's why we are hitting your hands if you are doing something which we think is dangerous for the object. But otherwise, I think we are open for everything, all the research. And I think we are not talking really about economical problems. Okay. But, but it requires us that we have to have stuff there. We have to take it where it is, as you were telling that there are all over in Scotland. Well, we have the same problem, so that we don't know perhaps where, where this particular musical instrument is. So it, it has to be fetched up. And after that, there's always a conservator there to waiting for you to do something wrong exactly. and to say no. Uh, and, and you can't report it. So it's going to demand our staff time from our staff, but I don't know if there's any other uh, problems. Okay. And uh, in the moment, uh, we are in a, in, a, in a situation that we are moving our collections uh, from our central warehouse, which is 100 kilometers northwards, to Banta, which is very much nearer, so they are much more easier, they are more easy to access. And we are building now this, all, all these studies there, for visitors, so I think after two or three years, uh, I mean everything is ready. So if if you all really want to come and have a look of our musical instruments after two or three years, I think it's perfect. Yeah, I think it's, it is a question of logistics, very practical mm -hmm. and mundane considerations. I, I want to introduce a point that maybe Simon would be happy to follow. Um, you, you said something which is which is very clear, which is um, we are concerned that you might be do some you, you might do something, have a gesture mm -hmm. that is is not safe for the mm -hmm. Um I want to address the elephant in the room when mm -hmm. it comes to musical instruments, if I may, which is 
not doing may also happen. Uh, what do I mean by this is that um, we know as practitioners that when instruments, when instruments are stored, data is zipping, zipping away mm -hmm. just by the sheer passing of time. Mm -hmm. um, so, on one hand, we might be talking about an archaeological petrified, in some cases, instrument. Uh, I mean, I would not be open. I wouldn't feel confident myself touching it, even me. I would be afraid of touching it. I wouldn't touch it. On other hand, um, on other occasions, we are dealing with much more prosaic objects that are not, don't are, are not archaeologically in source. Right? They are, you know, collections. The person died. It was given to the museum. Uh, sometimes I might even perceive that as, as a burden, because you go like, ah. Oh, the guy died, he had 150 instruments. Mm -hmm. Now what? Mm -hmm. Family doesn't want the instruments or can't keep them. Mm -hmm. They shove it into the museum. I think that's a burden for the museum, of course. Because then it becomes a huge warehouse of boxes mm -hmm. with no God knows who inside, what inside. Um, may I tell the story you told me? It, it doesn't mention anyone about I have 20 of those. You can tell whatever stories you want. Please, do, do you want to? Well, the well, point, the point I mean, is that... I think the, the, the big issue around which you're circling is something that also uh, Aki mentioned in his um, introduction. Uh, he, he said, I can't remember the exact words, but something like, we, can, you know, we can't be experts on everything, or we're not the experts here, or something. And I think that's, that's a sea change in the way museums operate within broader culture, because for a long time, museums were authority structures, they were, they were the, the, the font of knowledge, or part of a font of knowledge, they were experts, or they were regarded as experts. And you touched on the business of cataloguing at the beginning, and you said, uh, I think you said something about, you know, that they're not all right, you know, they're not all correct, they're not, you know, they're not, the catalogues were made either a long time ago by people who had limited access to certain kinds of knowledge, or they had different motivations for the for the process of cataloguing, you know, maybe not entirely dispassionate ones. I mean, one of the histories of musical instruments, for example, is, is that a lot of the instruments which are highly valued were highly valued because certain individuals who wrote about them also earned, owned particular instruments and had a, a, vested <laughs> interest in, in, a vested interest in saying, well, this was an important maker because I have one. Um, and and that, we haven't entirely escaped that yet. But there is a different model for how expertise might be approached now, which is more distributed. And one of the things, one of the difficulties that museums might face is that they have precisely catalogues which are 120, 150 years old, which are inaccurate, which are frustrating to people who want to access the collection, and frustrating for the museum because the museum would have also the motivation to have a, a more accurate and more precise catalogue. So maybe one of the things that we should be looking at is. And one of the difficulties that's faced is how the community of people who have interest in musical instruments and the community of people who run museums might get together to improve that situation. And one of the things that would be that would seem obvious is that you get lots of the experts on this or that to rewrite the catalogue. Now, of course, that's difficult because a museum is an institution with certain kind of entrained control mechanisms, and it wants some way of assessing external expertise if it's going to open itself to some kind of wiki-like structure through which the catalogue might get rewritten or reinformed. A lot of museum catalogues are appalling, even the ones which are written by people who report to be experts. Not all, but many. And there is, as many people have mentioned in different ways, a lot of distributed expertise out there, not necessarily in the places which are formally recognised as housing expertise, so not all of it is in academia. But maybe it could be a role for academia to act as a kind of agent or agency through whom that expertise might be channelled in order to act as brokers with museums so that they have some kind of editorial function, so that museums can trust external information that's being added to or, or edited in catalogues through the involvement of some kind of academic structure which functions as a sort of 
threshold for the museum and, and guarantees them a certain kind of level of, of accuracy and, and um, rigour in how that catalogue is reconstructed. And I, I don't know whether that's something that museums would be open to in general or whether your museum would be open to in particular. I mean, but there's obviously, you know, just in the last couple of days I've spent here, there's a huge interest in and expertise in bagpipes, which is what this conference is about, which is, a lot of which is local, and a lot of which is distributed quite locally, and there isn't necessarily yet a mechanism in place whereby you, as museum curators and, and, um, and directors, can access that information easily. Mm. And it seems a pity, because it's, it is really just a matter of simple protocols and logistics to put in place a structure, especially with digital technologies, through which that expertise might be farmed. And that might make everybody's life better, but it's one of the biggest frustrations for musical instrument researchers with regard to museums, is that the data is often so bad. Um, I was, how does that feel? Do you, think, do you think there's a role for academic institutions to act as kind of intermediaries? Definitely. Okay. And as a matter of fact, some part of our musical instrument collection has been catalogued by okay. experts. You're all ahead but of only a very, very small part of it. Mm -hmm. But that is needed. That is really but then that's important because there's already a model for it to happen. Mm -hmm. And maybe if more people knew about that instance, mm. that could be generalised out to become a practice that would inform more museums. And that would be fantastically valuable from our point of view. Yes, I, I suppose that uh, uh, this case, which I'm not talking about, uh, it was... Uh, an, um, we didn't ask for it, yeah. but it was asked us to have a permission to do that. Yeah. So it means that all of you have to be active and if you are giving us the information of yes. these musical instruments, so you can get your hands on them in the same time. Yes. Yeah, so that, that is a cooperation, what is needed. But an initial stage might be to publicise the fact that that has happened within a small area and has been successful. Yeah. Because at the moment, I, I think I'm right in saying not many people know about that. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, once that's in the public domain, maybe some, someone in academia could write that up and, as a small paper and it could be distributed and it could be then a matter of public knowledge that there is a model for this happening and it being successful, non-destructive to the museum's management structures and, and uh, perceived expertise but benefiting the research public as well. Um, you know, maybe there are more of these successful initiatives than I'm aware of but uh, my, my personal experience is that mostly when I go to a museum catalogue I ignore it and look at the photos, because that way I can tell much more. The problem, of course, is that with musical instrument museums, in general, the photographs are awful, low resolution, this big, <laughs> um, and, and that access to that, material, to that data is not one of the things that's currently privileged. Um, I wanted to, to make a tease of sorts as, as, as a way of pushing the discussion forward. Uh, you said that, uh, first you said that um, museums were the holders of the knowledge and so on. Um, and, and, uh, and we get the catalogues of 150 years with information that is, is definitely, uh, it's uh, most of the time, and sometimes, at least with backpacks, it's laughable. It's, it's, it's so wrong that it's almost a very and then you said, well, the museums might not be okay if all of a sudden the catalogue be becomes a wiki. Which I understand. Right. Okay. So a wiki-like structure. Wiki -like structure. What, what, yes, what yes, I, yes. What I was looking for was some kind of protocol for, for allowing the farming, the maximal farming of expertise while also maintaining some kind of threshold and gatekeeping. So gatekeeping, that, that yeah. was exactly the point I was making and I wanted to, to make a tease. Wouldn't that be substituting one of the structures by another structure called the academy and to the points that have been made during the morning uh, the knowledge for example in folk instruments doesn't appear to be in the academia so will we will to have a better catalog do we have to make the knowledge go through academia and then from academia to the museums as a way to accelerating the process of updating the catalogs the the, the, <laughs> the catalogs or is that actually the wiki structure 
Wouldn't actually the wiki extraction work? What do you think? Because it's not like it's not like the catalog is dictating policy, or is it? I don't know. How does how do you feel? Well, about I can't that? imagine that most museums would be entirely happy about their catalog system being entirely open to to reauthoring. Mm -hmm. um, there has to be quality assurance, a yes. quality assurance process that everyone feels, you know, everyone is bought into. Yeah. Um, and in a collaborative space, that you know, setting up what that uh, quality assurance and, and we all have an interest in the safety of the objects. This is not just the interest of the museum. <laughs> um, and, and at the same time, we all share an interest in, in pushing forward understanding of, of, of the objects. Um, and so that again is a common um, a, a, a point. And I think that the, the, this, this, you know, you, all together we've identified this sort of maximal farming out or, or distributed knowledge uh, network creation, uh, creation of knowledge through a, a, a broader network. Um, that it brings in not just academia as, as traditionally conceived um, and uh, um, curators, but also uh, the, the artisans or, or the practitioners who may feel that they're outside academia, although there are such encouraging signals uh, um, <laughs> of, of, um, of those with embodied knowledge. Uh, for example, in, in the preservation, and this, this ties in very importantly with conservation. Uh, so how does one maintain uh, 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 um, wooden objects that are, have often been in, in uh, far more, or, or have been brought into um, environments that are very much drier? Uh, and, this, and the changes that this has on their uh, um, physical <laughs> uh, um, dimensions that we notice measuring instruments. Um, and uh, uh, so this, this sort of network between, the, between uh, academia, artisans, uh, practitioners, and uh, um, curators is uh, it's, uh, an ecology. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't, I mean, of course, it sounds like self-interest because I'm sitting here, you know, pretending to be an academic um, and representing academia in some way and I'm suggesting academ academia as one of the ways of interfacing museums with the broader public for practical reasons and because institutions tend to find it easier to talk to other institutions. Um, I'm not in any way suggesting that expertise is located yeah. either entirely in acad academia, uh, far from it. I mean, I think the problem for ac academics and academic structures is how they also acknowledge the changing structure of expertise and acknowledge that most expertise doesn't lie in academia just as it doesn't lie in museums. Um, I, was, I was merely suggesting ac academia as a way of acting as the gatekeeping or thresholding uh, element in that structure. And yes, I can see that that might be off-putting to in some cases, individual makers and so on. I mean, it's also to do with the nature of the way in which something is considered to be data or expertise. Um, you know, academia is based on, unfortunately, has, has a very, very long history of being word-based. Um, and instrument making simply isn't. You know, my experience of talking to and interviewing instrument makers is is replete with big silences where you ask people what they're doing and they say, I'm using this thingamy, thingamy to do that. <laughs> and the thingamy that they're doing, A, they made, B, doesn't have a name, C, doesn't have a name because it doesn't need to because the only person who ever uses it is them. And if they have an assistant, the assistant knows what the thingamy is before the person who is they're assisting has picked it up because they know what the process is. It's this kind of process of tacit knowledge. And that's really difficult. That kind of quality of knowledge and experience is very difficult to record. Um, and I think that becomes really difficult when you're talking about instruments like bagpipes, which don't have the kind of conventional, in general, don't have the kind of conventional maker structure or making structure behind them, or haven't until recently. I mean, now I know that instruments are made the same way, you know, whatever they are, whether they're folk instruments or art instruments or whatever. And, and the making processes 
speak most clearly of whatever the economic system is that we're working in now. But, you know, I think that's another thing that we could learn from because the ways in which musical instruments are made now have quite little to do often with the ways in which they were made historically. You know, the, the sort of artisanal, careful thousand hours plus making that Barnaby was talking about this morning is something that simply couldn't have existed in any other, in any other era because it wouldn't have been economically supportable. People who made musical instruments in the past were either very, very pragmatic or driven by strong economic motivations. It, it's only in the late 20th century that you know, um, wealth became sufficiently unequally distributed that you know, somebody could make 12 Baroque oboes a year and make a living out of it. That's not really an economic model for, for any kind of reality other than that of the late 20th and early 21st century. And musical instruments were never made like that in the past. Mm. I, I understood what you meant uh, regarding the academia. Uh, it was a tease, so that we got that wonderful clarification. And on the other hand, I do agree that uh, academia has a role to play and has a responsibility. And if the academia is not going to take the responsibility, then who is? You know, it's museums and who else? You know, so, um, uh, the clarification was about, I wanted to, I, I wanted to hear Ulrich. I thought he was going to jump in because you do believe that Unfortunately, in many, in many levels, there is this tacit knowledge or this uh, body of knowledge that hasn't yet reached the academia. And when it, when it does reach, it, does, it, sh it should be brought to certain standards, wh which make it you know, stronger, I guess. Um, so that's, that was my expectation, that, that you were going to jump in. Um, but, uh, but I do feel that the academia has a role to play and that we have to stop pretending that we don't. And, but not in the sense of gatekeeping, in the sense of uh, promoting or establishing bridges and ways of communication. Or even, I mean, we can discuss maybe this, has to do with the credibilization of, of, of research and, and, uh, and uh, the credibilization of, of the people that are engaged in, in, the, in folk music, for example. Okay. How do you see this? Well, so maybe in folk music research and musicology, if you want to make a difference, <laughs> uh, the situation is a bit easier because we, uh, for centuries, we uh, depended, uh, depended on private researchers, uh, enthusiasts. And they are part of, uh, of doing a musicology. Uh, and I know in historical musicology the situation is a bit uh, uh, different, but we really try uh, to engage uh, practitioners to invite to conferences. Uh, this is a usual, a usual business, um, I, I would say, and find a, a common, common language. Uh, but there's really a disbalance in, in, in the knowledge. And of course, uh, when I find some iconography, iconographic resource somewhere on the internet, I try to find who uh, I posted it first, it's not always easy, uh, and at least who uh, uh, has communicated uh, this knowledge uh, to me. So, yeah, this is a, this is a general uh, situation. Mm. Well, in the field of uh, instruments I am studying, it's a problem, there are very, very few researchers. When I started in Russian in the 80s, my research, there were all over, all over Russian, maybe five uh, researchers um, considering um, traditional music instruments, five, six, uh, hardly more. Mm -hmm. Now we have hundreds uh, of these uh, enthusiasts and they continuously contribute uh, new, new sources. Yes, but the, the question is, how to find framework, framework for this. And in the piping world we have these international uh, networks, uh, several. This is maybe a special uh, discussion, how to bring them uh, together. I'm not very up to date in the international uh, piping world, no more in Central Eastern uh, European. Um, may I very shortly return to uh, the point where we are audio recordings. Uh, 
One uh, theoretical ethnomusicologist, uh, Igor Matsevsky from uh, St. Petersburg, he uh, in the 80s already had the concept what he called syst uh, um, systematic ethnophon ethnophonolo ethnophonical uh, approach. Okay, this is not a very widespread term, but he says strictly if you take one flute from one village, you cannot measure one flute and then analyze uh, the music from the other, uh, from another flute, uh, but you have put uh, this together. And the ideal situation in the museum, of course, would be here is uh, uh, musical instruments, and here is a recording from the tradition, precisely from these instruments. Mm -hmm. Of course, the aulas came out of use before the, the phonograph was invented. <laughs> so, but um, the ideal situation would be uh, to have a so-called authentic recording. Uh, now everybody hates this word, but you know what I mean, from the pre-revival uh, tradition played. Uh, let's take uh, uh, Ant Pauls, uh, the Sweden, uh, Swedish Estonian bagpipers. His bagpipe uh, is preserved, the recordings are preserved, yeah. and it would, would be so great uh, to bring this together. And the transcriptions are, are available. So this would be the ideal, the ideal situation and the best source quality uh, we can offer. But uh, of course it depends on the instrument. Uh, we, uh, we study of the tradition. Um, it is for practical, re uh, obvious practical reason not, not possible. But uh, it would be the best way of presenting those instruments we could document uh, from the tradition. The integrated fashion. Yeah. There are some wonderful initiatives um, that are in um, course at the moment in digital humanities and the interoperability of collections, both the museum collections um, and the ethnographic collections and contextual evidence that, that, that enable um, museums all over the planet to bring related objects together. Um, and this works provided interoperability is taken as a priority <laughs> and metadata standards are, 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 are shared between the, 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 the many projects that are currently going. I mean, the Louvre um, and the Lyon uh, um, uh, museums are, um, this was at the ISGMA conference in Berlin in November, uh, there was a presentation on, on that project, which is just, uh, um, I think it's in its preliminary stages, but there's a lot, for example, there. Um, about eight academics uh, at various institutions. You know, that would provide a very interesting uh, um, a set of, of, of uh, parameters that, that could then be learned from um, um, here, where, where through digital humanities, um, um, the democratizing of, of um, you know, the, uh, enabling people, there are systems where, where the amateur, the, the, the knowledge that is outside academia, maybe none of us are aware of, can be uploaded by some individual um, in a site that, 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 that simply connects. It doesn't have to be uh, our site, it could be somebody else's site, but because the web allows uh, uh, digital resources to talk to one another, they become accessible. It's really sounds great, and is great. Uh, it depends, of course, of the goodwill uh, of the people engaged. Well, I've had a funny situation uh, in St. Petersburg now. There are types of balalaika from the Volga Kama region with the oval body. Many of them are in Sweden. And uh, there's big discussions and they uh, copy these instruments, reconstruct. Uh, and then I saw to one uh, leading enthusiast from one museum, uh, you know, in Petersburg, uh, in, there are three ethnographic uh, collections. You know that in the Kunstkammer, uh, 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 two kilometers uh, <laughs> distance in Petersburg, they have the same instrument. Oh yes, uh, and I sent the data. Uh, yes, but it is very hard to access and so on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, maybe it's different situation in different uh, uh, countries. Uh, but from my experiences, can can be very different because uh, if it depends just on the uh, personal relation where you can yes. get access. I think in general it is, uh, well, probably in the museums here we're working with uh, <laughs> another approach. Mm. Yes. Um, I don't know if 
if they have questions. Uh, I feel we all deserve a very nice cup of coffee. And then uh, making some music might be more than what, what do you guys think. I would like to finish on a, on a positive note. Uh, <laughs> May I, Please. just to, to the uh, discussion of the morning, at one uh, moment, uh, yes. bring, to, uh, bring together uh, Simon and Barnaby. Uh, when you uh, you mentioned uh, Karen Dave and uh, the other one, uh, my God, uh, Social Life of Musical Instruments. Elliot Bates. Elliot Bates. Uh, when I read their uh, papers, uh, fascinating ideas, but um, uh, very uh, elaborated. But the basic of these ideas uh, is partly 100 years old. Uh, it's a big language problem because a lot of, this is not a Germano centrist <laughs> statement, but a lot of literature and theoretical organology uh, is written in German. Uh, Kurt Sachs, uh, Stockmann, Emsheimer, uh, Elschick, and this model, and they actually don't uh, consider musical instruments as object. This triple model, man, human, now man, music, uh, instrument, uh, it was so widespread and it was invented uh, several times, uh, starting in the 50s with Felix Hörburger. So the ideas uh, are there and the distinction be between uh, organography and organ organology. It, I think it's quite uh, easy, even elementary organography as a organography as a, a part of uh, organology. Uh, there are so many uh, absolutely well forgotten ideas yeah. and bicycles newly invented. Very beautiful bicycles. <laughs> and, and, and I don't think they're bicycles reinvented. I, I think. Uh, I mean, I was very careful to say at the beginning of my talk there is nothing new here. I mean, I um, and, and I referred back to. Kevin Dorn and Ian Bates. It's not about you, it's, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I don't think, I think they would also have been the first to say that they were not saying anything new. What they're doing is restating, I mean, they're both ethnomusicologists primarily, uh, and I think that's important. It's an important distinction from most of the people who are involved in musical instrument study. The fact that they come from a, an, um, that they have kind of ethnomethodology behind them, anthropology behind them gives them that context, especially social context, and a, and a kind of acknowledgement of, of the importance of field work and, and the supporting infrastructure around the pseudo-objects that are musical instruments. And yeah, I mean, I absolutely take your point that, that, that there's nothing new in that. That's, what, that's how ethnomusicology has tended to operate. But that's not how the main body of organology has operated, which is why I think there are more and more calls from within it and from just outside it to take on an approach that's more like the one that you're pointing out is is incredibly lengthy historically. It's just not general practice. And I mean it's also the case that ethnomusicology and other areas of musical scholarship haven't always been the most communicative with each other. Um, and that has been to the detriment of both. I mean the pretense that ethno-musicological ethno methods can't be applied to immediate, his, historically immediate or, or geographically immediate cultures it was immensely damaging to ethnomusicology. You know, the, the fact that it was, you know, wealthy white men studying people of another colour of, of from a different plant, you know, a different continent, did, a, did an immense disservice to the ideas behind ethnomusicology and it's taken a while for that to be to be dealt with, um, you know, that was that was ethnomusicology's elephant in the room, and, and it would have been nice if some of these really not very helpful distinctions between different pretenses of musicologies were broken down and, and, and uh, hybridised rather more than they are. Um, I think, you know, uh, quite often my my talks to, uh, start with a not a call for action, but a call for indiscipline, and I mean, I, I really mean that as a as a sort of active contribution to knowledge. There are far too many people working with methodologies that have a general applicability but they apply them in particular ways because that's their habit or their job or whatever. And it would be very nice if we all listened to each other's practices a bit more. That's a practical question. Just uh, it would be very useful uh, to translate to English some fundamental theory, theoretical words. Even Geist and Werden from uh, Kurt Sachs, the idea that the instrument has an agency 
uh, not only in mythology, but in our minds when we interact with the instruments. Yeah. Actually, there was a, there was a pre presentation at a Galpin Society meeting uh, uh, conference a couple of years ago oh, yeah. by somebody whose name was I've forgotten, who was making precisely that point that, that Kurt Sachs, who is often portrayed as the demon um, of, of you know yeah. imposing unnecessary classification schemes and taxonomies was was a much more subtle thinker than that. That's all and the thing people know about him. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> Many people. But, but, and, and I think, you know, there's, there's a rehabilitation to be done there as well. He tried to find out about the functional context of these instruments as yeah, most as, as, he, yeah. as he can. Yeah. Very well. Uh, I think we know. Yeah, um, that was a positive note on which to <laughs> Thank you so much to all. I have actually one. Yes. Oh no, my God. I would like to say. Um, yeah, it just uh, reminded me this. Uh, thank you for the ideas and talking. Um, just one observation, which is obvious. We don't have a music museum in Finland. So there's no such thing as a museum devoted to musical instruments. And uh, um, as Ulrich, Ulrich said, uh, the collections are scattered everywhere. It's, it's like a bits and pieces here and there, and you have to know where to search for. But uh, I was wondering that uh, if we actually had, uh, or you who come from bigger countries, uh, who might have uh, music devoted muse museums, uh, what does it mean actually? Does it mean that the expertise of the museum uh, uh, is is uh, able to grow from because you have to have a staff, obviously, who is aware of the uh, musical instruments and all the context around that. So that might help in creating this kind of culture where there's more knowledge and there's more context and there's more wisdom about uh, such things. It might help, but certainly. Uh there isn't always a perfect match between um, theoretical expertise and actual expertise okay. in, in such structures. So there are some very good musical instrument museums and there are some which have probably the most restrictive and most um, and the highest levels of misunderstanding between potential researchers oh, and, right. and cura curators and conservators that, that might be imagined. So I don't think automatically having a, a musical instrument museum or a music museum is an automatic uh, resolution of the of the difficulty that you're talking about, and also physical physical distance is less of an issue than it once was. I mean, some of the some of the methods that we were talking about, and which were exhibited this morning, are an indicator of the fact that you know one doesn't necessarily always need the physical object. One needs the information around it, the context around it, much more, in fact, and access to that kind of data might be much more significant now and should be much easier, mm -hmm. let's say. And if, and if you know, if Zeshuan's uh, brave new world comes to, comes to, the, to be the case, uh, um, you know, museums of the future, museum, musical instrument museums of the future may have online a download where you can download your uh, 18th century oboe, um, print it on your home 3D printer and try out what a Baroque oboe was like, without necessarily needing to visit the physical object. And it's not the same thing, but it gives you some important qualities to explore, and that might be, you know, a new mechanism. There's somebody there who's going to disagree radically. Yes, there's a, there's a comment from the chat saying, from oh. Eminem, there is a museum which has been a long time in Turku, Sibelius Museum, which is dedicated to music. Yes. <laughs> There are, there are different places, of course we have a big collection also in Kaustinen, so there are places, but there's no, I, I mean, uh, I was wondering if, uh, doesn't it mean that if you have a music dedicated museum, uh, it, it must help in the cataloging issue, uh, that must be uh, solved by that, or yes. don't you think? Uh, so, uh, as I got an internship in the music instrument museum, uh, one of the things I want to cover uh, of the previous topic is it really depends on who runs the museum. Like, uh, for example, you got a curator who is an expert in keyboard instrument, 
and then you got uh, the conservator in like string instrument. Uh, and another curator um, is a brass uh, expert, which will lead the problem with like they can catalog those things yeah. absolutely perfectly, but almost have no idea about the woodwinds. And uh, the first day of my internship, uh, the first thing I did is I, I talked to them. Oh, the the chanter orientation of the French pipe, the corner wheels, is a little wrong. That's the thing need to be fixed, exactly, exactly. So the expertise really will depend on like who run the museum here. And uh, yeah, that's one of the things. Uh, sorry, what's the, 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 the later question you ask? Well, I, I might, uh, uh, I, I think I can clarify on one, or maybe not. Christina will correct me. Maybe we're not talking about uh, physical geographical, architectural notion of an instrument museum. Maybe uh, there is a, uh, maybe collections would not be okay with opening, uh, giving away their instruments, uh, just to centralize them in one building, which is the uh, Musical Instrument Museum. On the other hand, the question begs the question, where in Helsinki? And, and this is a question that is very pertinent for many European countries, why the capital? Um, so, uh, but, 3D printing from your home, uh, Zoom calls, um, it, is this notion that uh, Christina is pushing forward of musical instrument museum? We can even discuss the word museum uh, going forward. As yes, people already. appear to be questioning the word library. But there is already such an initiative, actually, Gonzalo. There's the MIMO, the Music, Musical Instrument Museum Online. The difficulty with MIMO is that its technical infrastructure isn't foolproof. Um, its implementation is dodgy. Um, uh, the photographs are often, and because there are different institutions who buy into it, the quality of the documentation and photographs is extremely uneven. And the management infrastructure is uh, is not entirely transparent. The one, and one of the things that they're most resistant to is the involvement of people who are not part of museum structures. So although the reality is that the most important music, musical instrument connection, collections in the world are almost all in private hands, no private collections are represented in that uh, MIMO system. And more of the expertise is distributed into the private collections than in the public ones. There's no fault there, it's exactly the practical thing that Aki started talking about. How can somebody who's responsible for a museum which has a million objects be an expert in 1% in of them that you happen to be interested, interested in? It's not a reasonable expectation, but it is a reasonable expectation for there to be some structure in place which enables people to... Uh, to, to adjust that and adapt it in some way, and I would I would think that you know something like Mimo should be uh, approached and adapted to be something that's both more supple and subtle, faster, uh, has better visual data because it's mostly awful, um, uh, and allows access to expertise that isn't institutionally based, mm -hmm. because that would immediately make it 100% more interesting and useful and it would move towards the kind of structure of a kind of virtual museum with a, an online front end that is the kind of thing that Christine is suggesting might be appropriate. Yeah. Yes yeah. and no? Yeah, I think uh, this, is, this is the idea um, that I meant, that how can, uh, I mean, I'm after the, uh, maybe um, uh, it's not even a structure, but an idea of how can we connect the museums to the people who understand about the instruments. Because at the moment, I and Gonzalo, you were talking about academia needs to be there. Maybe, or what, what is the instance that needs to be there? Somebody needs to be there because now I see, I, I think it's mostly like uh, private researchers whom the museums might be aware of or not. So I know that, for instance, Rauno, who, who was chatting here, uh, there online, uh, he has been in contact with uh, some museums, with some uh, exhibitions that uh, stated things that are not true. So <laughs> it, it has been up to private researchers to react to uh, 
things and we, it, we would be uh, better off with, if we would have some kind of uh, connectedness between museums and uh, the research community somehow in some uh, steady fast manner that stays there and is not dependent on private people who might be um, unavailable. The difficulty there is that often private collectors and private individuals no longer trust museums. In the, in the historical past, someone who had a big private collection would almost inevitably have left it to a museum on their demise. Most private collectors now, the last thing that they want to happen to their collection is for it to go into a museum. They, they mostly try and distribute it before they die because the last thing they want to happen is for the collection to become unusable and, and ill-cared for. Those are quotes from people who actually have private collections in which everything works, everything's in perfect condition, everything's kept in perfect situations. Um, and those are, you know, those are the biggest collections in the world now. Um, please. Ravo just wanted to add here that he says that uh, we have in Finland Music Museum Association, the members are two Accordion Museum, uh, two. One is in Accordion Museum, Sibelius Museum, Kansan uh, Soitin Museo, and Kantele uh, Museum. We have our own uh, magazine. So there's something happening certainly in the folk music area. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, please. Uh, I would say that the National Museum in Finland uh, is looking for cooperation with other institutes and it's quite clear because we do not have the expertise, we, are, we have less and less people who are doing the research of, of the collections and of the objects. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it means that we have huge gaps of uh, musical uh, other objects which nobody really knows something. Mm. And uh, I, I, I think I'm, we are not alone. I think it's uh, all of the museums are looking for cooperation because we do not have stuff to do the real work, what we should do. And that's why I would say that it's a good time, if you are interested, I think it would be a good time to be in contact with the yes. National Museum. Yes. And uh, I can't see anything, anything opposing yes. this kind of. Let's start with a perhaps a smaller project, yes. and let's look, go further and further that project and, and, and make it larger. I, I understood uh, Christina was in a slightly different perspective than than I, I might be a little bit more focused on Finland and our local issue. Uh, and maybe I can express my, myself by creating a little uh, hypothetical situation. A professor, a doctoral candidate, receives an email from Austria saying, Oh, Gonzalo, uh, Cristina, I'm really interested in the balalaika. Could you tell me if there are balalaikas in the museum? And our answer would be, I don't know. We're just the Sibelius Academy. Call the museums. Uh, on the other hand, if he calls the museums, and they say, yes, we have a certain relax, but we don't know much about it. And he asks, well, but is it this period or that? He would say, I don't know, ask the Sibelius again. That's where the research is being made. So I think there is this... Uh, um, certainly, the, certainly if, even if it's not taking all the instruments, putting them in a building that we call uh, music, uh, uh, instrument, uh, music Instrument Museum, there has to be some kind of uh, connection, some kind of, uh, of, of even from a, a strictly communications level. Because right now I found Aki, and I'm not letting you know, <coughs> because now I'll send you emails and ask stuff from you. But, but until now, I didn't know. I would try here, I would try there, I go to the website, and there's a general address, and then people say, well, people are very kind, but, 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 uh, they might not well who the person because I got to you through another mm -hmm. person in the museum that said I'm not qualified to speak about musical instruments. Mm -hmm. You should talk to Aki. Mm -hmm. 
but, uh, but at the same time, it's not your role. You have other, you know, you are here because you care, as I, I've been telling I'm, I'm you. I'm doing Viking salts. <laughs> so, yeah, slightly yeah. different things. Of course. Mm. But you did, uh, were kind to, to come uh, mm. and to, yeah, to talk sure. with us. And then there's this link. Mm. And uh, I would really would like to end on a happy note. Because I feel that this is the starting of something beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we can, we can, we can do uh, As a conservator and, and from the conservation department, I, I would still want to say that if you are interested in, in analyzing musical instruments, we have some equipments for yes. that. So for instance, we have X-ray, mm -hmm. we have XDR, we, we have FDIR, mm -hmm. and so on, so that um, they are available there. Right. So then if you want to know about, for instance, metals, claps, what are they made of, or if you want to know what kind of adhesives have been used. Yeah. Yeah. So we can perhaps solve that kind of problems too. Perfect. Mm -hmm. we, I think things will uh, change, because we all want mm -hmm. them to, to change and to improve. Thank you so much. Uh, let's get the coffee and uh, talk because there's uh, music, uh, musicians in the audience that surely want to discuss this stuff with us. And then let's make some music all together.